us as we worship tonight. Lord, we love you. God, we, we put our focus on you tonight. Lord, you are so good to us, and we thank you for the reason that we celebrate Christmas, which you came down to earth to be one of us, Lord. We thank you for that tonight. Sing Heart the Herald. Heart the Herald, angels sing glory to the newborn King. Peace on earth and mercy by God and sin is reckoned. Joyful all the nations rise, join the tribe of the skies. With angelic hosts proclaim, Christ is born. Bethlehem, hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Christ by highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord. Late in time, behold, He comes, offspring of the virgins, filled in flesh the God has the incarnate deity pleased as man with men to dwell Jesus our Emmanuel hark the herald angels sing glory to the newborn King hail the heavenly prince of peace hail the son of righteousness God and life to all with healing in his wings, mild he lays his glory by, born that man no more may die, born to raise the sons of earth, born to give a second birth, hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king, hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. The angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains and the mountains in reply, echoing their joyous strains. in excelsis Deo, which means glory in the highest. And this song is referring to the book of Luke, um, where the shepherds uh, are met by angels, and they're talking about the birth of Jesus. And this song is sung by the angels, lifts up God to the glory of the heavens. 
Um, but ironically, Jesus is born in a manger, in the lowest of lows, um, which reminds me of this scripture in Philippians. It says, though he was God, he did not count equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took up the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. And it says, therefore, God elevated him to the place of the heavens and gave him the name above all, the, all other names, that, that by that name, Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you denied yourself, that you denied your divine privileges that you had in heaven. You became one of us. Thank you, Lord. privileges as God. You didn't, didn't count equality with God as something to be grasped, as that scripture says. But Lord, you became one of us and you died on the cross for our sake. We thank you, Lord. We worship you. We pray this in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You guys may take your seat. Amen. And thank you, Pastor Ben. Well, we want to thank everybody for being here this evening. Uh, we're so grateful to have you. And uh, 
it's it's Christmas Eve tonight, and we want to um, we want to welcome you here. If you're here for the very first time, you've never been here before. We're going to ask you to fill out a little card in front of you, and that just helps us to know who came and helps us to track you to the ends of the world. No, it's not. It's not what we do. We just want to be able to help you, or call you, or let you know if there's anything that we can do to help you or minister to you in some way. We're happy to do that. So um, this evening, uh, it is the end of the year, and so we just want to give opportunity. Um, it's Christmas Eve. We want to be very clear. If you're visiting with us, please don't feel compelled in any way to give, but we're going to take an offering this evening for those who are still trying to catch up for the year. And so uh, we're just going to pray and we're going to ask you to um, just feel led to give out of, uh, out of, out of cheerfulness, meaning uh, the word of God says that we are to give in a way that's cheerful, that's happy. So, uh, and I'm clear about this always. If you're not giving from a place of joy and, oh man, they're talking about money again. Don't give. It's okay. It really is. We don't have cameras in the ceiling. I promise you. Nobody's watching. You know, listen, this is simply an opportunity uh, for those that are trying to catch up to the end of the year. So by all means, um, if you're visiting with us tonight, you're our guest. And all we want is for you to be blessed tonight. Amen. Can we pray for today's offering? Uh, this evening. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your kindness and your grace. Uh, we are so grateful that your generosity uh, knows no bounds. We cannot outgive you. Uh, we will never outdo what you've done for us. So this evening we pray uh, as we approach the end of the year, that we would uh, we would just be accountable for every dime that comes in. We're so grateful that we as a church have been able to do uh, work that you've given us to do because your people are so faithful. We thank you for that. We pray that those that might be struggling uh, today financially this evening, I pray that you would just pour out a blessing. And I pray that you would open our eyes. Later, Father, we'll be talking about light and the gift of light. And I pray that you would shine a light and 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 help us to see what we're to do to honor you, that even those who are struggling today to give might be blessed and might see what we're to do that would bless you. We love you. We thank you in advance for all that you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, uh, we want to get, uh, we want to just get a few, a few thoughts uh, across this evening. And so um, we're going to do that. And, uh, We want to, again, as I said before, we want to thank you if you're visiting with us. And um, we wanted to talk about this evening, I wanted to talk about a little bit about lights, about the gift of lights. We've been spending uh, the last several weeks on, on the gifts that God has given us and understanding the gift and what, what Christ means. And, 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 and through it all, it's really, it's really a story of redemption. It's a story of ever since the beginning uh, of time in, in the Garden of Eden, uh, God has been trying to bring Adam and Eve back. Ever since Adam and Eve sort of blew it in the garden, uh, God has been trying to bring us back. And it's Christmas Eve, and we want to talk, obviously, about the greatest gift he's ever given us. And that gift that he gave us is the very way, is the very way it's the very gift that allows us to be redeemed. So we are going to talk about the light this evening, and we're so grateful to have all our little ones with us today. And I hear the little kids, and normally at this spot in the service, we'd say, okay, all you noisy little rugrats, out you go. But we're not doing that tonight. We love our kids. I'm sorry, Jaden. Did I offend you? I called you a noisy little rugrat. I love you, buddy. You can stay. <laughs> my own son. Of course it's going to be my son. Who else would say anything? Um, anyway, so um, we're so grateful for our, for our kids to be with us. We're going to be patient about that and just uh, talk about this a little bit. Just very quickly, I just want to ask just a random question. How many of you like the pitch black? How many of you like like pitch darkness? The curiosity. I'll, I'll, I'll share this with you. This is personal. Jaden, you can't, you can't even sleep with the full lights on. Put your hand down, buddy. He's still involved. Oh, boy, he's going to be involved the whole story. He's not used to this. I like to sleep in the pitch dark. For whatever reason, when I go to sleep, if it can be like dead, you're shaking your head, no, like, oh, no. But there's a lot, well, there's a lot of people. They, they, you know, you can be full-grown adult, and you still need a little nightlight somewhere. Come on, tell the truth and shame the devil. If, if, if you're a full-grown adult, and you're like, eh, I kind of like a little bit of light at night, just raise your hand real quick. No, some of you are lying. 
The rest of you, I appreciate your honesty. Some of you are lying. Okay, that's all right. That's okay. So, um, listen, light, light's a powerful thing. Light's a powerful thing. You know, as ministry, we're, it's all about church, and I've, I'm all about church, and we talk about sound, and we talk about music, and light, light is kind of a, a relatively new phenomenon that churches and places worry about lighting. What does it look like? Well, guess who knows all about lighting, and they've known a lot longer than the church has? Show business. How come they get all the good lighting? Can I share something with you? Why is lighting so powerful? Because God gave you eyes. All right, now we're done. Ju Ju Juliana, let, you're, you're officially in charge. <laughs> listen, listen, you have ears, and music is powerful, and it moves us. Can I tell you something? You have eyes, and light moves us. Colors move us. If you've ever seen the Aurora Borealis live, if you've ever been standing somewhere and seen a beautiful rainbow or a sunset or a sunrise, tell me that's not moving. Tell me that's not beautiful. Tell me you don't look up at the sky and see streaks of red. One of the places that Andrea and I love so very much is Arizona. We love it out there. I don't know why, we're just drawn to it, and it was very pretty, and it's, you know, I, I wasn't even, you know, most of the times that uh, Andrea and I got to go away, it was usually where my family was, in Europe or something like that, but for whatever reason, uh, you know what, I, I actually, I remember the reason, uh, my father-in-law had passed away, and so we thought, you know what, let's take, let's take mom somewhere different this year for Christmas, and we were looking for trips, and I think we sort of accidentally stumbled on you know what? Sedona's beautiful, and they've got this special over Christmas. Let's go there. This is years ago. And Andrea and I went, and I literally fell in love with it. I fell in love with the smells, the look, the rocks, the formation. It's so pretty, and it was so beautiful. And, and there are people in Arizona that we would talk to. They're like, oh, Northeast, you from New Jersey. It's so, the trees, it's gorgeous. And I'm like, eh, right? Why? Because we see it all the time. We see it all the time. But when we were in Arizona, these beautiful lights, talk about the light reflecting off the Grand Canyon. What's more pretty? Uh, and so lighting matters. God gave us ears. Sound move you, moves you. Gave you a nose. Smell moves you. Well, that's not, that's not a pretty thought at Christmas. Yeah? How many in here like food? <laughs> look, look. God gave us our senses to be blown away by them. And they do blow me away. And light is one of the most powerful things he gave us. As I said, it's Christmas Eve, we're so grateful. The ability to see light is amazing. You look at the eye, the eye is something that is not reproducible. I don't care how advanced we are technologically, you're still not gonna reproduce the eye completely because we are not yet God and we never will be and we'll never understand the, the nuance of what it means for, for the, the reflections against those the corneas and in our eyes and, and the cones and, and the back of the eye that that are ear they're not reproducible it's why there are still people to this day that we can't completely cure blindness we're not able to only God can do that but light is something amazing it's something miraculous the sun itself hits your skin and it turns tur your skin produces vitamin d light's amazing Right? Some of you are really pale. You say, no, no. And when the sun hits my skin, I crisp up like a vampire. But most of you, when the sun hits your skin, it's kind of cool that you can actually produce vitamin from the sun hitting your skin. Did you realize that there is a, a torture method that involves just keeping somebody in the dark? That's it. They... They put somebody, and somebody actually subjected themselves to testing to see if people that had been subjected to darkness, to see if it was true. So there's a few volunteers, and they said, you know, put me in the dark. Let's see if that, let's see what happens. One of them was a comedian. In 24 hours, he was going insane. In 24 hours, he was lo losing his mind. He thought, now they had gone through studies. He'd been, he'd been with them. They prepared for months. After 24 hours of perfect, perfect darkness, he began to think, they've duped me. It was all a mistake. They've abandoned me. I'll be here the rest of my life. 
Darkness, something about pure darkness messes us up. You say, what about somebody that's blind? I don't know. I don't know. They have to learn. They have to learn how to cope. It's very difficult. Now, somebody who's never seen the light doesn't know what to compare it to. How do you describe light to a blind man? If somebody's been blind their entire life, how do you describe light to them? They can think. They can process thoughts. What do you, what do, you do? You talk about shapes? You talk about colors? What does it mean to somebody who's never seen them? Right? It's a crazy thought. So this light is, is a big deal. And now here's the, here's the thing, as beautiful as it is, as a big a deal as it is, as big as a deal as it is, the New Testament talks about it multiple times. There are at least 76 mentions of light. They say, Pastor, I'm not that bothered by light, darkness. No. If I'm in the light and a little spider crosses my hand, I might go, whoa, 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 whoa. Right? Or I might even, but if I'm in the dark, if I'm in the dark and something crawls across, I'm going to scream like a small girl child. I don't care who you are. Listen, if you're in the dark and you can't see what's happening, all of a sudden, just that little crawly, it's not the same, is it? Is it? It's not. It's not the same. And there are 76 references at least to light in the New Testament alone. Number one, here real quick, just a few quick thoughts. It says this, God is light. It's compared, God compares himself to light. It says in John chapter one, verse five, John tells us, this then is the message which we've heard of him and declare to you that God is light. And in him, get this, there is no darkness at all. Mm, there's a lot of theology there that we don't have time to unpack, nor are we going to this evening. But there's a commentary that writes, that writes this way, reads this way. Let me read it to you. Here's the commentary. Here's what it says. The term light in the scripture is an emblem of purity, truth, knowledge, everything good, everything positive, happiness, as darkness is of the opposite. Light is literally a representation of all that is good, and darkness is a, a representation of all that is opposite. So God is perfect in purity, complete truth, with no error, absolute knowledge, without any ignorance. He's not subject in any way to error. There's an infinite happiness there. There's no darkness in here. Number two, number two. Secondly, this is kind of sad. The New Testament teaches me that as much as God is perfect and in the light, man is imperfect and in the dark. That's what it teaches me about me. You say, well, pastor, I'm kind of a nice person. I'm kind of a nice person. But here's the truth of the matter. The truth of the matter is in our flesh, we're not God. We're not pure. We're not perfect. In fact, the New Testament says this, by our nature, flesh, the flesh actually shuns the light. Let me read this to you. John chapter 3 verse 19 says this, and this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. How many know something this evening? You have to, when you, when you, when you do something bad, you don't have to be very old to understand this. When you do something bad, what do you want to do? You want to hide it, right? And then everybody in here under 10 years old said, um, yeah. Faith, can I ask you a question? If you, if you accidentally break something, if you accidentally break something, what's easier, to take it and brush it into the trash and pretend like nothing happened? Or to say, hey, everybody, I broke something. What's easier? No, that's the right thing to do. You're, just, you're messing up my illustration because you're a sweet child. You're messing me up. I should have asked my own child. He would have said the opposite. <laughs> but you're, but that's, that's good, honey. You do that. You do, as I, as I literally lead her astray. Listen, mo most children, most chi my children, okay, maybe it's just my children. If, if, if you do something bad, if I do, so if I do something bad as a kid, what's your instinct? What's your inclination to hide it? And the scripture in the New Testament talks about this. It talks about as a, as a person, as flesh, as somebody, as somebody who, if I don't know the Lord and, and, and my, by nature, I do things I ought not do. I like the dark. I want, I don't want the light uh, shining on what I do. Look, folks, you might be a real nice person. I'm going to get personal now. 
Don't get offended. You might be a real nice person, but at the end of the year, you're you're filling out your tax forms. Pal, sister, my friend, if you lie on your tax form, you don't want anybody shedding a light on that. Why? Because at the end of the day, you know it's wrong. You know it's sin. You're not going to you're not going to project that from the rooftops. You don't want anybody to know about that. Ouch. And listen, I hope nobody in here does anything like that. But the truth is in our flesh, when we do something in our imperfect way, the inclination is to say, oh, I don't really want anybody to know that. Guilty pleasures. Why do you, why do you think they call them guilty pleasures? Because there are things that you might do that you feel bad about. You don't want them known. And listen, the truth is when you come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, what's the whole point about this baby? What are we celebrating right now? What are we celebrating? The, the birth of this perfect, innocent life in a lowly manger. What are we celebrating? That he is, that he has come to shine a light and to show me how imperfect I am and to help me to understand, wow, I have a lot to hide. I have a lot to, I thought I was kind of a nice person, but I'm actually not. Because I can never understand myself fully until the light of Christ is shining on me and showing me, oh, oh, that's right. That's right. I need, I need, I need a rescuer. I need a savior. And that's, that's what Christ is. It's the light of Christ that clearly allows me to see my flaws and be able to be honest with myself and say, wow, God, I, I do need you. You know, but we're so hard. We're so, we can become so, so calloused a little bit. And we say, we are, I'm, I'm, you know, pastor, you know, I'm, you're talking about yourself. I'm a pretty good person. Listen, all of us need rescue. All of us need salvation. All of us need a Christ to say, I know you're not perfect. I don't care. I want to save you. I want to shine grace. I want to shine a light on what you can give to me so that I can redeem you of it. Listen, the light is all that's going to save me. The light's all that's going to save me. The light of Christ is all. No liturgy is going to save me. No liturgy is going to save me. No Religion in itself will not save me. All the prayers in the world won't save me unless they're genuine, unless they're between me and Jesus. I don't care how spiritual or religious I look. That's not going to save me. No ceremony, your experiences, your history, your past, your traditions, all, some of them might be very sweet. None of them will save you. The only thing that saves me is the understanding that once I recognize there's a light in this little baby Jesus and he grows up and he dies and he, he's, res he's, he's resurrected again to show me, hey, I see, the, I see the error. I see the problems in your life. I don't care. I love you anyway and I'm redeeming you. And we accept that, right? Look, tis the season for gift, and the greatest gift you're ever going to get is Jesus. Tis the season for gifts, and the, and the greatest thing you're ever going to get is not the new food processor you wanted. Husbands, can I just tell you, do not get your wife a vacuum cleaner. Hopefully we've known that by now. We should learn. We should learn that by now. <laughs> what? Somebody, there's a lot of muttering going on. Did somebody buy a vacuum cleaner? No! Nobody bought their wife a vacuum cleaner, did you? Please, oh, thank goodness. All right, I think somebody's lying still. But anyway, thirdly, third real quick comment here. The Bible teaches me that Jesus is the light of the world. Described like this, John introduces that Jesus came, right, John? Chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, the word that became flesh in him was life, and the life was light of men. It was the light of men, and the light shines in darkness, and the darkness doesn't understand it. When Jesus was born into this world, he was the one who manifested understanding of who God was. It took the light of Christ for me to get, to, for me to understand who God is at all. And he shined all of that truth on me. Number four, fourth quick thing here. When we're saved, we come into the light. Here's what it says. Ephesians chapter five, verse eight. What do you mean when we're saved? I mean, when I accept Christ, when I acknowledge, yeah, you know what? I hear what you're saying, pastor. You're right. I'm not perfect. I am a person who, who, who in my flesh, I have sinned. I made some mistakes in my, in my time, but I, but I want to receive Christ. And you accept Christ. You acknowledge that he's the son of God. We talked about this this moment, uh, this morning in the book of Romans. It's very easy that you confess with your mouth. You believe in your heart that Christ is the son of God and that he died for you. And he came in order to forgive us 
right? That's the point. So once you do that, understand, then that makes me the light of the world. Now you're a flashlight. If God's the ultimate source of light, you're his, you're his tiny little beacons all over the world. And later on today, we're going to do something. Later on this evening, we're going we're gonna to do the candle lights. And I, I always love that. It's beautiful. We'll dim the lights back there and all that. But uh, here's the thing. Every one of us in this room has a choice either to accept Christ or not. And if you've accepted Christ, it makes you a little bit of that light. It makes you a little bit of that light drawing people towards Christ. And we get that sense that we get that sense that we're, uh, if we're lost in the middle of nowhere and somebody sees a little flicker. There was somebody lost years ago in Yosemite Park, they, and, they, and they, they got stuck in a cavern, and it was, uh, I don't remember the exact details, but the illustration's popping into my head right now. They were lost inside the cavern, and they were, I guess their, their cord broke or something, and, and they were down there for days, and of course there were people searching for these hikers, these spelunkers, and they were going through caverns and this and that, and they were found after, after several days, they finally found them, and I don't, I can't, I think one of them expired, actually. Actually, and but one of them survived and it, it, they were asked what how did you survive what you do and they said well it was so dark and it was so black down here but I could see a teeny little pinpoint of light when the Sun was up so I realized now it's daytime and it gave me hope thinking now they're looking now they're looking for me do you understand all over this world you're the pinpoint for someone. You're the pinpoint for someone who's looking. You, you, you might be here tonight. You're the one searching. Well, well, Christ wants to be found. He's not hiding. He's not. But, but for many of you who have a relationship with Jesus, understand you're actually the source of hope for somebody that's in darkness and they see you, and they see a little pinpoint of light, and you're their hope. You're their opportunity to draw them toward the ultimate source of light. That's a big deal. Pretty good gift to give for Christmas. Let me move on here. Paul says, <coughs> excuse me, Paul says that we're ministers those of us who know Jesus and our responsibility is this comes out of the book of Acts to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they might receive forgiveness of sin and inheritance. Acts chapter 26 verse 18. The story of Jesus born in a manger um, so long ago who came to die for our sin. You know, may God help us to tell the story. May God help us to shine. May God help us to be contagious about what it is we're celebrating right now. Look, the food is great. The trees are pretty. The gifts are fun. Unless it's a vacuum cleaner. I think we covered that. But look, the problem is, the problem is if we forget the point of what Christmas is, it's a waste of time. There's a lot of people trying to fill their time, their heart, their happiness. They're trying to, they're trying to uh, establish it through stuff. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. You can buy all the stuff you want. Apple and Target and whoever else. They will not, Amazon, they will not supply peace. They will not supply salvation. They can't. They don't know how. But you, you're a pinpoint of light. And if you have a relationship with Christ, I pray, and sorry, forgive me, I pray that God doesn't let you sleep. I pray that he messes up your rest. What? Listen, I pray that he shows you who you should be shining at. Because if we are Christians and we love Christ and we're not acting as pinpoints of light, your light might as well be out. Well, that's kind of harsh, Pastor. Yeah, I pray it for me too, though. I pray it for me too, though. I am, I am saved by grace. I don't do anything better than anybody else. I don't have anything anybody else doesn't. But I'm saved by grace, and because of it, God show, showed me this light. And I am a pinpoint of light, simply showing other people how to get to Christ, how to get to the gift, the ultimate gift that we're talking about. And First Peter talks to me about this a little bit. 
Some of you are here, you're, you're saying, you know Christ, you have a relationship. You say, Pastor, I don't go to church here, but I'm a Christian. That's fine. You know, I'm just not real vocal. I'm just not that type of person that's real outspoken about my faith. Well, your life will show it. Your life will show it. You'll still shine. First Peter in 3.15 tells me, tells me what? It says, always be ready to give an account of what? What you are. Always be ready to give an account for what it is you believe. And so I'm always ready to do that, and I pray that you are the same. Look, I'm going to wrap it up. I don't even know what time it is. I didn't wear, to wa didn't wear a watch. What a shame. I could preach for hours. No. <laughs> Listen, here's the thing. <laughs> here's the thing. You may very well be the only source of encouragement, of light. Now, I'm not suggesting that uh, we're supposed to call. Listen, there's a difference between me walking into my place of work and arguing with somebody about Christ. That's not what God asked me to do. He didn't say, listen, you find every atheist, you find every Muslim, and you start a fight so that you can prove that, you're, that your story... Look, here's the thing. Here's the thing. The only way the light of Christ is going to help someone is if they're searching. My job is always to be ready. Always to be ready to present it to them. Not to... Not to, get in a, not to get in an argument that does nothing. In fact, the word of God tells me very clearly, avoid vain arguments. It doesn't help anybody. But if you can always be ready, continue to be that pinpoint of light, the opportunity will come that you're able to shine. Light and darkness. It's a big, big difference. You know, I don't think you even realize, you look around and you say, Pastor, the people I work with, they seem fine. They're fine. People I go to school with, they're not looking for anything. What are you talking about? Nobody's searching for anything. Look, you don't, you might not understand. You might be searching yourself, but if you're not, you don't even realize people are scared. They're terrified. And the older we get, the, the, the longer we live on this earth, the more important it becomes in our thinking to realize what happens next? What happens next? This is real. It's not a story. It's not just it's not just Christmas carols. There's a real Jesus. He was really born. He was really born so he could really die, so he could really be resurrected, so he could save me, so that when I die, I'm not afraid, but I've accepted him and I have inter eternal life. This is a real thing. And uh, you may not realize this, but the people who you don't know, they're around you, they are, they are suffering. They are searching. Some of them may even be terrified, and they're just waiting for somebody to speak something encouraging to them. For somebody to speak a little word of, hey, how you doing? You know, let them see Christ on you. Let them hear it in your voice. Let them hear it in your voice. Look, the dark terrifies people whether they know it or not. Whether they know it or not. One last story and I'll quit here. My father didn't have much when we, he, we came over here from Europe, as I said. And uh, I was a little boy at that time, born there. And uh, <coughs> my parents um, moved to the States. My uncle told them, oh, you got to move to the state. We were in Germany at the time. You got to move to the States. It's the land of milk and honey. You're going to love it. Well, we moved to Pennsylvania. Reading wasn't the land of milk and honey. And then my uncle moved to Florida. That's not the point. I'm, I'm losing my, my train of thought here. But God blessed. And it was fine. God blessed. And so here's my dad and my mom with four kids. And God helped them. And they got established. And they bought a little house that they lived in. The first house they lived in cost less than most of your cars. I promise you. Literally, their first house they lived in was probably about $7,000. And they had help with that. But they found it. And they, they, they did all right. And they established. And they worked hard. Here, four kids, whatever. And then they, you know, my mother was working as a seamstress. Uh, I try not to bore you here. Eventually, the, the tailor she was working for retired. Said, hey, Josephine, do you want to buy? Now, my mother's not here with us tonight. But um, blessed that she's been tending here. Um, that she lives up this way now, down this way. And so the, the tailor said, you, Josephine, you want to buy the place? She said, that'd be crazy. But she went home and said to my dad, hey, do you think we could buy it? And so they did. They bought the house. They bought that building. And it was, you know, it was big, big money. It was $30,000 for that house. Now, today, still a car. But at the time, huge. And God was helping them. God was blessing them. So they lived in that house for a number of years. And the house had a couple apartments in it. So they rented a couple out. And they made some money. And then my father, who knew nothing about construction, decided he was going to be the local slumlord. 
Yes, I'm a little ashamed uh, because he did not know how to fix a building, but he decided I'm going to buy that building across the street, which was incidentally condemned, and I'm going to fix it up and rent it out. So he bought it and he fixed it up by his definition. Let's just leave that part alone. Let's just leave that part alone. Contractors in here, you'd be just like, you don't, you don't even want to hear. That's ho horror stories. I'll tell you horror stories. But in his mind, he's like, it's fixed, right? Well, we went over there, he and I, to do something in one of the apartments. It was dark. Frank, you're, you're smirking because you probably know this story. I walked, my father and I walked into this building. It was dark. And he, and there was just a little bit of light coming in from the window. And he opened the door and it was dark. And the door was black. Only the problem was it wasn't black. It was a white door. And the black was moving. And so now as he's standing there with his hand on the doorknob, the black was now on his hand. And now my father, uh, toughest man I've ever known, is screaming like a small girl child. And so I'm screaming because he's screaming. It was covered in roaches. Covered in... Now I can take spiders. Pastor Ben can't take spiders. You want to see him scream and run away from you like a little girl? Approach him with a spider. But I don't like roaches. I mean, I don't like roaches. I mean, I don't like roaches at all. A spider, they're kind of noble. I like spiders. I don't even hate flies as much. Something about a roach. We both ran out of that building as fast as we could. But the thing that made it the most terrifying was while we were running, it was dark and we kept running into stuff and we couldn't find the door. I, I'm telling you, it might as well have been a horror flick. I want to share this with you. The people around you don't even know they're in their own horror flick. They're looking for light. They're looking for the door. They're looking for a way out. You're it. Don't be shy. Talk about it. Be the pinpoint of light for them. Amen? Otherwise, the beautiful story of a little baby born in a manger is just that, a story, and is much, much more than that. Amen? I bless you. We have a video that we want to show you this evening. share this with you before we begin to sing here tonight listen the very same way the very same way your candles are going to be lit from someone else lighting it for you that's exactly the way that the hope and the light of Christ works it's exactly how it works it's one person showing their flame to somebody else and the truth of who Christ is 
and the truth of what a story of a little baby to a virgin teenager. Mary was probably somewhere between 12 and 18. Most details point to 13. This is a young teenage girl we're talking about who just believed what God was going to do. And this baby is born. It's more than a story. And the way your candles are lit right now, that is as contagious as Christ works. minutes with us we're going to ask that you just hold your candle up with you for a moment can we allow this to be our prayer in fact if you if you want to stand if you're comfortable standing will you just do that all over the building here just stand up hold your candle up we're going to pray one final time here before we dismiss father we're so thankful for you we're so thankful father god for your gift for the gift of jesus christ for the gift of this little baby born in a manger so that we might have life, so that we might recognize, so that we might see from the gift of light that you gave us our need for you. We love you. We thank you. We pray your blessing and your protection on everybody in this room. I pray that you would allow our time uh, to be sweet with family this evening, tomorrow. And we just thank you for the opportunity to be together. We pray that you'd give us a chance to shine our light with someone else. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for spending a little time with us. 
Hug somebody on the way out, but hug them after you turned your candle off so that you don't light them on fire. Again, we want to thank you so much for being with us, and we'll see you soon. God bless you.